Hello, everybody, says Carol. This webinar is now live. So we have people coming in and then in and in. in. I'll give it a few minutes until uh, more attendees arrive. Sabrina, looks like you're a tootsal on your own. <laughs> Lovely, so people are starting to come. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say hi to everybody through the chat room, okay? Cool. Hi, Trevor. Mm -hmm. When you're saying hi, everybody, you have the choice to make it to all panelists or all panelists and attendees. Mm -hmm. So if you want everybody to see you, you can make it to all panelists and attendees, okay, on the chat. So just to, uh, if you have a question. I'll wait till there's another few. Trevor, raining in Dublin. There's no rain. You need to move to Cork. Absolutely. Okay. Hi, David. Hi, David. Cool. Lovely. Okay, at the moment we have 17 people in the door. <laughs> 18. Can be leaving. All these patient faces in front of me. I suppose if I keep talking, people can only see my face, isn't that it? That's it. Like you uh, know, you're very there, sad. I'm very sad for them. Okay, everybody, welcome to today's event, day three of our four Friday afternoons. We have a jam-packed um, run for you today with um, almost ten people talking. So we're going to start. You you know yourself how the, how the chat feature works. You know how the questions and answers work. Helena Farrell, who waved to us, say hello there, Helena. Oh, we can't hear you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Helena is stepping in for Liz today. Um, and we have Farad here, as always, looking after my mental health and technological issues. Um, so we're going to start today. The first event or the first session up is going to talk about different initiatives that are happening in the further ed sector. And they're happening in all sorts of colleges. Um, you know, we might have teachers here that are saying, telling us stuff that's happening in one, but quite often there's the same kind of stuff is happening in other colleges as well. We follow that then with our literacy and numeracy strategy, and we have a two pronged approach to that one from Youthreach and one from the training center and the apprenticeships section of our organization. And then we have two students to come and talk to you and perhaps answer some questions you might have for them about what it's like to be on the other side, listening to the likes of us. And after that, we have Edel, who's talking to us about the prison system and other outreach programs from there. And we have John Hines coming to us from Kinsale. There's a whole lot of Kinsale, isn't there, in this thing? Yes, God. Um, coming to us from Kinsale about talking to us about outdoor educational activities. Uh, fresh off another conference that he was involved in yesterday, I might add. But anyway, they're all welcome. Um, and we'll start off, I suppose, we start off with Farad. Um, where if you were here on the first day, you would have heard me say that at the same time that I was appointed to my role, Farad was appointed as the TEL coordinator for the Cork ETB. 
Um, and before that, he was a treasured employee of St. John's Central College right there in the centre of town. Um, and he can tell you himself what he was doing there. But they have an awful lot of technical um, activities, I'll put it that way, going on in the college. And I must say, I haven't checked just yet now, but if Jim Kelleher is in with us today, Jim is part of our network, you'll see there's a, a, a physical poster behind me. There's a photograph of it behind Farad. Inside there in the, one of the logos is the Cork Active Inclusion Network logo. And we wouldn't have that logo except for Jim Kelleher in St. John's. So thank you to Jim for that. I'm going to leave Farad to talk to you now for a few moments and then we'll be on to Eddie. Hi everyone, I'll be very fast. So like Carol said, I was 20 years or 20 odd years teaching in St. John's College. So basically there it was all computer, IT and maths, that type of subject. And in the last 10 years, I was the course coordinator for game design. So it was very interesting because you could use different technology to have it inclusive for students and all that. So, and in 2007, I got my B post and Moodle came from then, do you know what I mean? So, so I started, so I was there for St. John's, so yeah, roughly 20 years. And uh, I've been working with different colleges even before I got my new post helping and doing different things. So it was always interesting to see what we can do to improve and to teach online. That was basically uh, there. So like Carol, I got uh, the job as a tele coordinator a few months ago, just before COVID. And from there, gone from zero to 100 overnight, like, like everybody, you know, teaching online and all. So some of you have met me in the last few months. I've been going around. Uh, two things I wanted to do when I started this new job. One of them is one bite-sized training. I don't want to just do it one in September, one in December, and one in May. I wanted to build up relationship with different centers and teachers so they can train and see what they need. That was the first uh, the part I'm doing at the moment. So some of you know that. And over the summer, I've been working a lot, try to amalgamate, try to put together Office 365 and Moodle working together. So we are 95, 99%. So next part I'm deploying is with UseReach. But that's what I've been doing. So basically I'm the IT guy behind the scene. I'm like the electrician at home. You don't see the cable, but if they weren't there, it wouldn't be working. So that's my job really like plus training. So thanks everyone. And all thanks to St. John's in a, in a big way as well. Yes, yeah, I've learned a lot there. So our, our next speaker is Eddie. Eddie is coming to us from CSN in Tremor Road, my oldest alma mater. Um, and I shall be quiet now, sorry. Um, good afternoon all, I hope you're well and in good spirits. Um, so just a bit about myself before I start. Um, as Carl said, my name is Eddie Fleming, I'm teaching in CSN College for about 20 years now. Um, and as well as a teaching role, I have taken on a tele support role as well, which means that I offer some kind of technology support to um, staff and students. Um, at the moment, based, that's mainly to staff. Um, I, I had I had worked in the United States for a, a number of years in both middle schools and in a, in a high school there as well. And to be honest, I kind of felt like um, a dinosaur in the classrooms there because um, the amount of technology that was incorporated into every lesson was something that was very new uh, for me and that they were completely um, uh, paperless as well. And this is going back nearly um, uh, seven, eight years ago now. So this was kind of kind of attracted me to getting involved in uh, the Tel Group. So I've gone to a couple of um, conferences and done some training around this as well. So I um, uh, suppose our our experience in uh, teaching online at the moment would be that uh, what I have found anyway is that unless you're using these technologies in the physical uh, classroom. I think that it becomes very challenging for students and teachers to then suddenly start using them online. So I would advise people to keep things simple that whatever students are used to using and whatever you're used to using, then I would say probably stick with that until you get back to the classroom again. So what I'm going to do today is um, Carl asked me to look at two um, resources that we could possibly use. So one is going to be aimed at kind of students and teachers, and then is one, uh, the other one is going to be a teaching resource. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. And I'm going to show this, okay. So um, the first uh, resource I'm going to um, go through is a resource called ThingLink. 
And um, I have, I've never used this myself, but I did discuss it with Carl a number of years ago because I've seen, uh, I saw other teachers uh, using it. And it's particularly useful depending on the sort of subject that you, um, that you, are, that you are teaching. So um, what Pingling is, it's, um, it's a cross-platform tool. Um, and it's, it's also a, a, a learning re a resource. And what it allows you to do is you can um, annotate images and media in a very, in a very simple way. Um, so uh, it's suitable for students at all levels. And it's, stu it's also suited, uh, suited for teaching at all levels as well. So from that point, from this point of view, it's a very um, adaptable and it's a very uh, flexible uh, resource also. Um, it can be used in the classroom. It can be used for remote teaching. Um, and students can use it to guide their own learning as well. So um, when I've seen students use this, it's, it's obviously excellent for uh, independent learning. And it allows um, students to learn at their own pace. And it can also be very useful for students that might learn uh, better by using um, uh, visual media rather than using, um, say, text um, all of the time. So it's a web-based, um, uh, it can be web or app-based, app and it's a free, and there are also premium versions. To my knowledge, you don't really need the, the premium version. The premium version just allows you to collaborate with more people. What I would say for most people's uses, the, um, the free version should work well. So um, it works very simply. Um, you upload um, an image or a, a media file or text um, to the app or to the web browser. And then it allows you to tag various parts on that image or various parts on um, a piece of, of video. And then with each of those tags, you can add another image. So it kind of it layers on top of the o o original image. Um, and it, when uh, you um, when you uh, move your cursor over the various tags, then these various uh, things you have added will appear. So you can um, put questions up there in the form of Google Docs. Um, you can put videos up there. Uh, you can put audio up there so that um, students can learn in a variety of different ways while also engaging with the image as well. So I'm just going to show you an example. Um, so this is um, for anatomy and for learning parts of the human body. So you will see that every time I um, move the cursor over the tag, um, uh, you can, uh, um, another resource will appear. So it helps students to explain what these things are. You can also make it from a teaching point of view, uh, you can make it um, uh, more active uh, and you can use it as well to assess um, students as well, depending on um, how you want um, to use it. Um, students can also take um, these images home uh, like on, on, on a bus or anywhere, they can, like if they have to learn off certain things, um, they can use them at any time, they can access them at, at any time. And some of these as well won't need any, any Wi-Fi um, um, uh, connection at all. So when I, I first um, was showing this to Carol, we thought it might be useful for um, the anatomy students who have to learn various parts of the body and, and so on and so forth. Um, I've also seen it used um, by uh, mechanical and carpentry students who had to learn the various parts of machines and tools um, that, that they were using. I've seen it used in musical in music departments as well, um, where you want to students to learn the various parts of a score of music by learning what the various notes are um, and the various parts of the um, of the of the scale as well. So um, here's the second example, and this one is um, more interactive. So I'm just going to. Sorry, I'm just going to go back there. So this is the second example, um, and this is the um, Newcastle City campus. And again, each of these tags 
that you just place on the image. And the way um, the way this particular um, resource works as well, it doesn't matter what the um, image, what um, what format the image you you uh, you want to use that you upload onto the um, the the app. Uh, or onto the website, it will it, it works uh, the same way with all of them. So you just drag the tags on, and then you can add for that one. You could add a video, or you can add um, um, dialogue, or you can add a question, and so on and so forth. So that's how um, ThinkLink works. And then the uh, second resource I'm going to look at is um, one that's based more for the use of teachers. And this is called uh, Nearpod. And what Nearpod allows you to do, it allows you to uh, transform um, presentations that you may have already created uh, in the form of uh, PowerPoints or Google Slides or something like that. Again, uh, you upload your presentation to Nearpod. And then it allows you to add interactive features um, to the presentation. So um, this allows um, you to collaborate with students and for students to collaborate with you as you deliver the presentation um, to them. So again, um, this can be used in a number of um, various ways. It can be used um, online for remote teaching. It can be used in the, in the classroom. And also as well, students can use this without having any access to um, a device if, if um, in the classroom, um, teachers are, are using um, a data projector or something similar to that. So there's two kind of aspects to what you can do with, um, with Nearpod. Um, as I said, it's, um, it allows you to make every uh, lesson interactive and collaborative. Now, you can also begin um, a, a Nearpod presentation from scratch as well if you want to. But I suppose the convenient thing for teachers, if you already have um, presentations that you have used in the past, um, for, for want of a, a better term, Nearpod allows you to kind of jazz them up and maybe make them, uh, as I said, make them more um, interactive as well. So what Nearpod allows you to do then, it can add virtual reality to your presentation. It adds gamified quizzes to your um, presentation and it can add simulation and video to your uh, presentation also. Um, so it also allows for formative assessment in that when you set, you can set um, open-ended questions on your presentation, or you can put up um, word matches, or you can put up fill in uh, missing words. There's also um, a quiz game that the students can play. So when, uh, when you can prompt students to, to enter answers for particular questions you have set, and they can they can share those answers with other students, or you can just see it yourself, the teacher. But it gives you feedback straight away on uh, how quickly students are answering these questions, how many questions they are getting right, and you can you can uh, as a as a teacher you can you can assess pretty quickly whether students are are learning from these slides or not. Um, you can also um, when uh, what we used to before is we put Nearpod presentations up on on Moodle, and we allowed students to, um, to interact with them in their own time. But Nearpod also allows you to keep a record of um, when students do interact with it, so how long they spend on it. And, and again, it gives you feedback as to what kind of questions they might be struggling with and what tasks they might be um, struggling with, with as well. So you get instant feedback once the students are using these Nearpod uh, presentations. And as I said, it can be used in a number of, of, of different formats in a number of different areas. So again, it's, it's a very uh, flexible uh, resource to use. Just having used this in the, in the classroom on a, on a number of occasions, um, students of all ages really react very, very well to this. Um, because they're not just sitting, listening to you lecturing from um, a, a presentation. They are engaged in the, in, in the presentation at all times. And they can collaborate uh, in a group or, um, you, as I said, you can leave them as um, single students as well. So just to sum up uh, what's available on Nearpod. Sorry, now I've got to go into my site here. Just, 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 just. 
are you? Quick time check. Oh yeah, okay. So um, uh, as I said, just, this is just to um, review what I was saying. So you can share fun and interactive content with students. You can instantly collect and share answers by submitting, uh, by students submitting answers. You can track students' um, comprehension in real time as well. Um, and then for the students, it can be a live lesson or it can be student paced as well, where they can do it in their own time. And uh, these are the various things that um, Nearpod allows you to add to your presentations, uh, be it a PowerPoint or Google Slides. And these are the various assessment tools that you can add to your presentation. So open-ended questions, polls, quizzes, draw it, collaborate, matching pairs, fill in the blanks, and there is a memory test also. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thanks, Amelia and Eddie. I know it's so hard, isn't it, when you're in, when we, us teachers, we kind of have an internal hour clock nearly at this stage. We just well, well I, it's, one, it's one thing I haven't got used to when people aren't talking back to you. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm trying the same I keep talking to. Denise, honey, this is your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Amelia and Eddie. Um, Denise is from CSN as well, and you've met, I, I won't even do introductions. Off you go, Denise. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. As I say, I hope everybody's keeping well. Uh, it's Friday. We're nearly there, lads. We'll have a couple of days to rest. Um, so uh, I suppose a little bit about me. I'm Denise Ryan. I'm working at CSN. Um, I've been teaching there for 30 years now. Um, Eddie spoke about dinosaurs a while ago. Myself and Eddie are dinosaurs together. Um, and like Eddie, I would be part of originally part of the TEL team. So myself and Eddie have always actually over the years worked quite closely together on a range of things. Um, but uh, I'm here this afternoon, I suppose, in my role, I have an acting a post and one element of that is I'm responsible for teaching and learning uh, in CSN, which is um, quite large. And um, so I do uh, a lot of work and again Eddie works with me on this which is great um, delivering kind of training to staff and looking at what staff needs are um, especially in these COVID times but the other element of it really is I've kind of taken over I suppose this um, study support at CSN um, and we have traditionally at CSN had a, a really good study support uh, we're very um, I would like to think very student focused um, everything that we do and try to support students in their needs. And we have always been about um, inclusivity and um, no matter what someone's background was or their academics, etc. We're there to try and make sure that the student gets the best educational experience that they possibly can. Um, obviously, uh, what I think I think it's interesting about study support is that sometimes students seem to think that they must have an issue. They must have a so-called problem or a disability or something in order to come to the, the, the study support service. And it couldn't be any further from the truth. Our service is there for all students. And we try to send the message that um, Sometimes there's things that you can do that are just self-directed that might just kind of help you manage your time a little bit better, etc. Some students will have much more need of us than others, um, but it's about trying to, I would actually say, kind of destigmatize this idea of study support, where sometimes students see it as they don't want other people to know that they might need extra help. Um, and so it really is something that should be, it, it's, it's kind of a global thing for all the students um, in the college. So obviously COVID has had a severe impact on what we do and how we do it. And traditionally, um, the study support service is reliant on staff volunteering to provide study support. And we've been, I've been really, really lucky in the staff that, um, that do that um in helping support the students um so when covid hit i suppose we had to maybe try and take a different approach um so i'm just going to share my my um screen with you really quickly this will be quite short because carol told me five minutes and five minutes indeed is what it shall be um so um 
I discussed in the beginning. So as part of what we were doing, um, we realised very quickly that we wouldn't be able to provide study support in the traditional way that we do in a library one to one setting where people meet, etc. So we began to look at um, other options that we might consider. Um, and so we came up with this idea of what we call the virtual student hub. So just before I get to that, um, this is the virtual study support timetable that students received um, in November when we went um, online again um, fully. And you can see um, there, it's, it's colour coded. I'm a huge fan of colour coding, um, but it's colour coded really for um, a reason. One of the key things that I really tried to do once I took over study support at CSN was to try and match students with appropriate staff. And um, like I think all teachers can help any student who has an issue with assignments, etc. But obviously, if you have a student that is doing an assignment on anatomy and physiology, wouldn't it be better if we had a sports staff member who could help them out or music students with music and um, people, etc. And um, so this is um, what we call, I suppose, the virtual timetable. And while we have hours assigned and um, the students are made aware very quickly, as the staff are really fantastic, that um, they can make contact either through me or directly with the staff member themselves. And if the time that is up there, we say, for example, for word processing or 365 doesn't suit the students because they're in class, either a practical class on site or remote um, learning, then staff have been extremely flexible and giving them the support um, setting up uh, a mutually um, appropriate time to meet. The other side of it then is the actual hub itself. So on Moodle, we use Moodle as our learning management um, platform uh, within CHP and within CSN. And within that, I've just given you some snapshots that uh, we've set up um, virtual study and learning hub. Um, and there's kind of three pillars really that I've been working on within that. Um, there's IT support, digital badges and study skills. Um, and it's really trying to say to the students that this is a lot of it self-directed material. A lot of it has been um, borrowed uh, with their permission. Um, I'm a great believer in don't reinvent the wheel. If it's out there and it exists and people are happy to share, then why start something again yourself? And um, that's not to say that a lot of the material that we do have up on our um, hub has actually been produced by um, CSN staff as well. So from the study skills, this is just a sample of material. So things like assignment pre uh, preparation, study prep, essay writing, there's oral presentations, etc. But the other thing that I'm really conscious of um, is that a lot of learners learn in different ways. Um, and so when we put stuff up onto the hub that we're trying to address this idea of universal design for learning, um, and we're providing information maybe in multiple different ways. Uh, so we would have things like interactive H5P, we would have um, like PowerPoints with videos embedded in them, we would have PDF files, we would have video, there are podcasts, what you can see here on the screen is just a sample of some of the material that's actually available. Okay. Um, from an IT perspective, sorry, I've got someone talking in the background. Uh, from an IT support perspective, then we're, and we're building again on this all the time, we're kind of trying to include a lot of very short how-to videos is what we're calling them. So these ones here, for example, how to submit an assignment on Moodle, we've got how to create a Word file as PDF. We've a lot of Word ones that some of the staff have done. There may be a minute and a half, two minutes, short, simple, to the point. Uh, we obviously have the kind of guides that, you know, OneDrive or Moodle Basics, they can do an online course themselves. 
um, that's available for them. So we're trying to put in um, as much IT support as we can outside of that which staff uh, provide because um, Lucy Phelan, who is on staff and looks after, is in charge of the library, does a lot of support as far as Office 365, um, et cetera, is concerned. And the other element then is the digital badges. This is probably the shortest element of it um, because I'm in the process of trying to get some internal badges for ourselves. And if anybody here today knows of digital badges that you think might be good for students um, that I'm not aware of, I'm constantly on the lookout, then I'd be delighted if you would send me um, along things. Um, but I suppose just to wind up, really, the idea of the virtual hub was to try and ensure that we could provide as much self-directed stuff for students that could help enhance the one-to-one -one virtual that we have in place. And we do have some on-site study support, but obviously because of COVID, it is limited. So we tend to use that for the students who are have particular tech issues, where they find it even difficult just even to, you know, Office 365 and Word and all of that just is problematic for them. Um, if somebody, if we have students who are comfortable on the computer, um, then we tend to try and provide it on, um, in a virtual sense. Um, and that's it for me. Brilliant, Denise. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to roll it over now in two seconds to Suzanne Powell, who's coming to us from Mallow, um, and just say that um, Suzanne won't be sharing a PowerPoint with you. She's just going to be her own true self. Am I right, Suzanne? That's right, Carl. Um, so <laughs> we, years ago, when I worked in the College of Commerce, um, we had a mature students officer. Susan Holland was that person at the time. And when I went to Tremoro to CSN, we had a mature students officer as well. And um, so there's not a mature students officer in Mallow, but there's other fabulous posts in Mallow and Suzanne is going to tell us a little bit about that. Thanks very much, Carol. And it's it's lovely to be part of, of something like this. And I've already learned a lot from, from Eddie and Denise. So I'm looking forward to, to the rest of the speakers too. So um, I suppose just in terms of, of myself and, and coming from Mallow College, I'm also one of the uh, original members of the, the Cork Active Inclusion um, Network. So um, UDL is, is very much at the, the forefront of, of kind of everything we do. And um, I, I suppose me and, and my colleague Colette have uh, been able to bring that back to the college and um, we were fortunate enough to kind of deliver um, training in UDL to, to all of the teachers so I suppose it's um, it's very much in our mindset and we're trying to build it into our culture um, but as well as that um, I suppose what's maybe different at Mallow College to others is that we have designated posts and I suppose they're they're added on for um, health and, and mental health um, for student advocacy and for equality and inclusion and and even though I suppose these are um, new roles in a way we, we don't really have uh, much to, to model from we we're not aware of, of, of other colleges um, that have specific posts um, with these titles but I suppose it just kind of reflects our our aim to, to make kind of Mallow College um, um, I suppose a, a place where everyone is, is comfortable with difference and, and inclusion um, I suppose you know, being in a pandemic as well, we're, we're I suppose conscious of the the challenges that we faced. Um, but we found um, actually that that this pandemic has been an opportunity to really, really up the ante and up the game um, at Mallow College. Um, it was the first year we we've been semesterized, um, and the first year that we completely um, as a as a united kind of college went online um, using Moodle as our, our um, online platform. You know, so we got a lot of training in that, um, and the feedback back and has been excellent you know we've actually had improved attendance uh, improved retention and it really is because of the accessibility because of the semesterization everyone had to completely reimagine and redesign their course um, you know instead of fitting into the whole year we had to look at it again and I suppose it was a unique opportunity to put kind of UDL into practice and um, to make our courses more interactive um, we got trained in screencast-o-matic which means now that we make kind of short little YouTube videos to supplement our teaching um, and I suppose these are accessible now to all learners um, 
So um, as well as that, I suppose, in terms of the health and mental health, when students log on to Moodle, there's a tab right in front of them on mental health. It's right there. They literally, the button is there that they can press where they get immediate access to um, the Minding Your uh, Wellbeing videos, links to mentalhealth.ie, and of course, the, the guidance and counselling um, uh, Moodle page as well. Um, a lot of effort has been built, I suppose, just like the, the virtual hub for, for study um, in other colleges. And um, we've built almost a virtual hub for mental health, for health, for well-being and for um, contacts, for supports. Um, so really that that is, um, I suppose, not just for people who need it, it's, it's for everybody and it's accessible to everybody from the beginning. Um, so I suppose um, where we used to have this kind of model where um, additional resources were put for people who specifically asked for them and needed them. No, all of these things are, are done from everybody from the beginning. You know, everyone has access to mental health information. Everyone has access to um, the programs and the supports that are available. Um, and as well as that, I suppose, unfortunately, where we have been affected is things like student advocacy. Um, in, in previous years, um, I suppose we've done a lot in developing the, the student student council and activities that run from that um, and, and I suppose we've COVID has put a little bit of a, of a spanner in the works but the idea and the philosophy behind it is that everything every event that we do every fundraiser that we do is you know comes from the student themselves and it's about really listening to the, the student voice and, and reflecting that um, and the diversity you know and just kind of appreciating that um, in the college um, the other thing I suppose is in terms of equality and inclusion is making sure that I suppose that, that that it's always in the background, you know, that every staff meeting, every new initiative that we do, um, that there's somebody thinking of, you know, what that means for our learners. Um, and it also means that our, our teachers have, you know, ongoing kind of access to inclusion training and um, just the, the awareness um, that that brings. Um, I suppose, look, I, I've, I've more to say really about, about how COVID and our wonderful changes, but I, I don't want to go on for, for too long. Um, yeah, so look, I, I suppose, look, I'll, I'll leave yeah. it at that. Thank you. That's wonderful. I just I thought it was really, really good to, to see, you know, how different posts can be turned into things that are so useful on, on the ground for people. Thanks a million. So that's, that is the end of session one. And for session two, we have Sabrina Dorgan here as our youth reach rep. Our youth reach teacher rep doesn't sound so fabulous, does it? Uh, I come on and talk to us. <laughs> um, and then uh, Brenda is with her. Brenda is in the training centre. She works with the apprentices and they're both going to talk to you about the literacy and numeracy strategy. So many of you are aware that Solace have put out this um, call. The 31st of December is the deadline for it. They want to have a 10 year literacy and numeracy strategy for Ireland. Um, and we all the ETBs have to put in their submissions by the 31st of December. So um, Sabrina is going to start off and tell you how you three started off with this with the last FET strategy, because that was one of the key points of it. Um, what they've done, how they've gotten on, and then Brenda will tell you what she's doing with the same. So hi, everyone. Welcome from Cork down, uh, down here. Um, I work in E3 in Bandon. And in about October 2019, our AEO uh, New Lick Lantern tasked me um, and all, a load of other teachers with forming a literacy group um, or a cohort and meeting up and kind of working on um, integrating uh, an integrating literacy strategy for youth reach, which we all happily did. And uh, so we, we got together and, and we, we worked on it, but we also decided within the group that we could do more. Um, and we, we set ourselves tasks. We, we decided to give ourselves goals. Uh, we wanted to make a literacy calendar for, the, for youth reaches in the county, kind of, you know, each month would have a target or a subject matter that we would work on. And we would set competitions like essays or essay competitions or baking competitions, anything that would incorporate uh, literacy numeracy. And so we worked in, in tandem with that. Um, and we looked at the, we kind of more so uh, as a group sort of, we, we make recommendations for the strategy, but I have to say uh, my partner in crime who's missing today, Amy O'Halloran and Neil Ganton really put together the strategy themselves. 
Um, but in terms of the group, we have the group running up in teams. We met maybe four times last year. We've met once this year because of COVID. But it, we, we've run a team and it, it's, it's great to have it. We're running it through teams and you can come on there. We're sharing ideas. We're sharing problems and looking for advice from each other. We're saying what works in each centre because, as you know, every every student has different needs. Every you know school has different needs. And we've been able to kind of give recommendations saying this works for us or you know what would you do in this situation and we've been sharing all our resources um and that has been a really great support for all of us everyone can go on there it's not just for literacy heads like ourselves who are obsessed with it but for any teacher who's struggling with incorporating it or any teacher who has an issue with uh, a student's needs or, or anything like that to come on and look for help or make recommendations or sh share resources. So that's been very successful and we're quite active in that. And it's been a great resource for myself and I think everyone else that's been using it. Um, and then there's the integrating literacy strategy. Um, from my perspective, what I really liked about the strategy is it, it is very open to tailoring it to what you need while also having a very strong structure um, of how to incorporate literacy in the classroom and overall within a school or a center. Um, but there's still room to cater to your individual student needs. Um, and that's why I think it will work and it has been working really well for a lot of us. Um, so Amy, who couldn't be here today, has sent a little blurb because she was so involved in creating this thing. Um, so I'm just going to read it out. So just forgive me while I read it. But um, so this is this is Amy's two cent on it. Um, so she we don't have any overheads. We decided to just talk. But um, she assisted Nula in drafting the policy and her input is based on experience, not theory, which in a way was really great because it was on the ground experience of dealing with students with literacy issues. Um, I participated in the new policy because it was my belief that the existing copy had become obsolete. For my part of the presentation, I would refer to aspects of the policy which I believe are particularly important and my aspirations for its implementation. One of the aspects that sets this policy apart is the reference to challenges faced by teachers. Um, and implementing an inclusive classroom. To meet the needs of individual students while delivering a packed curriculum is no easy feat. The policy not only acknowledges this challenge, um, but provides practical in-class suggestions to overcome them, such as introducing collaborative teaching and using basic techniques such as keyword lists. The action plan and method uh, to assess the progress is also a virtual part of the part, a vital part of the policy. The policy was not created to meet uh, the requirements of the inspectors. It was created to use and modified to meet the needs of the individual centers. By setting out steps to create an action plan, oops, sorry, that was myself, uh, to create an action plan, centres and schools can set achievable targets and assess their process th or progress throughout the term. It makes what would previously have been a massive undertaking an achievable goal for the staff team. The final aspect of the policy that I believe is essential in the inclusion of this is the inclusion of assessments. The majority of youth reach teachers will attest to the fact that many of their students defy formal education. Um, their inclusion, inclusion of informal assessments acknowledges the fact that centres operate differently. A QQI level four delivered in Mallow may be entirely different to that of Ballon College. Uh, the use of informal assessments where centres can use their individual resources allows staff to allocate a student to a class, class that reflects their ability and the standard of the course being delivered. While formal assessments have their place, they often render results that are unusable depending on the course being offered. By having and using individual assessments, teachers uh, are assured and reassured that they are delivering an appropriate course to the needs of the individual student. I am a firm believer that the development of literacy and numeracy is a sole responsibility, is not the sole responsibility of an English teacher. This needs to change. Uh, regardless of subject area, every teacher has a responsibility to develop core skills of reading and writing amongst their students. Teaching to, um, teaching to make the marking scheme of a leaving cert or QQI course is short-sighted. At the end of the day, we are preparing students for life after school and that this policy or strategy suggests that and gives responsibility for of the rest on everyone's shoulder within the teaching team. In my plan, when the, when the demands of COVID guidelines 
helps ease the use of ethos of the policy to make the centre a, a reader friendly environment. Um, only this week I assessed a student who could not fill out an enrolment form as the language was unsuited to the struggling reader. I genuinely believe it is unfair and unacceptable for students to adhere to and sign policies and procedures that they cannot read. This policy was created using a plain and simple English. Um, it was done intentionally to act as a working example of how policies and procedures could be worded. It is my hope that in time educational establishments might practice what we all preach and provide a service from the front door in that acknowledges the challenge of every young person and addresses them in a dignified and fair manner. And I have to back that up. This, this literacy strategy was written so that anyone you know with literacy challenges could read and understand it and I think that like from the ground up was important for us that teachers see that we have to use language that is approachable to all our students and um, we're, we're we're working very hard on making all our assignment briefs and everything uh, literacy friendly as well as Moodle um, teams all that we're trying to get that done um, within our literacy group it's an it's an uphill battle but we're working on it um, and the strategy we've been for, we've been going through it step by step. We had our meeting there and we looked at assessment and the various forms and and how to assess for your learners in your centre. Um, and we we had a breakdown. There's several options and it can, it can cater to what you need within your school and within your student group. And I think that's the key to what makes this strategy so successful is that it is very strong, gives a clear outline and, and lots of advice and help, but allows you to adapt it to your needs and to your teaching team needs and to your student needs. So. Thank you, Sabrina, that is absolutely brilliant. And I just you know, want to reiterate, I was saying that myself in, in previous weeks, how we have to take account and realize just how many people have literacy issues. I mean, we have one fifth of the, of the population have dyslexia uh, to some degree, um, not to mind dyscalculia or dyscalculia, whichever way you want to pronounce it, we won't get into the argument. Um, and, and it's widespread. And a lot of our learners are coming from families where some of them are the first people in their families that are going to some kind of formal education. So I won't delay any further now because I know we're already over time. Brenda, the wonderful Brenda there from the training center, are you okay, ready? Okay, hi everyone. I'll just share my screen there first with you. Yeah. Okay, so my name is Brenda O'Connell and I joined the training centre here in 2019. So I'm responsible for support to apprentices. So I suppose just to give you a little bit of background, um, the support apprentice group, which is a national group, was set up in 2018. And it was set up to support collaboration amongst DTBs to continue, continually improve and develop resources in supporting the apprentices. Um, a lot of the apprentices would be away from learning for quite a while. So, you know, it can be quite daunting for them to come in and, you know, be faced with big folders of notes um, as well as their practical um, subjects. So the SAG group, it's a subgroup of the National Advisory Committee and on literacy, uh, numeracy and digital skills. And NAC then reports directly to the directors of FET. And every um, ETB, so all 16 ETBs are represented on SAG and that's co-chaired by Alison Jones from Galway, Roscommon ETB and Siobhan McEntee from ETBI. So, you know, that's very important that every single ETB is represented. So I suppose we meet four times a year. We were meeting around the country for since March. We've been meeting virtually and it's going quite well. So it will probably stay virtual. Um, so we have um, established a bank of resources. They're created and shared by all 16 representatives in collaboration with instructors and support staff. Um, and these resources then are available um, through the FET Digital Library. So what really is the um, sharing of resources um, that is really, really successful for the group. So what have we done? We have promotional videos, we have maths and study skills support handbooks. Um, a lot of the apprenticeship courses wouldn't have specific maths books. So um, we have these for each, each of the different trades. 
Um, we have math lessons done up um, on PowerPoint and uh, we have also created those into videos um, so that we can, you know, um, have multiple means of representation um, going forward on Moodle. Um, we have developed maths and literacy assessments for induction. And we also have um, specific trade assessments, practice tests um, for um, the apprentices to use. Now, the um, test would ha always have been paper copies. So at the moment, you now we're, we're just transferring all those and getting them up on Moodle digitally. So it's, it's great for, for marking as well. It's very, very good. And we, have, um, we can access the data then when we need it. I suppose just here in Cork Training Centre, um, what happens is the apprentices are introduced to support service at phase one. So that's while they're still on the job uh, with their employer. Uh, following that, they're doing a maths check and a literacy check. Uh, I then monitor the grades of that and we just uh, keep a uh, detail of the individual's that score less than 70%. And we would advise those trainees that they may need to um, avail of support. So we then schedule um, support classes. So um, at the moment, the trainees are all doing their induction online. So they're doing their maths test online. Um, and we will back that up with um, support classes online, maybe in spring for, you know, when we when we have a good cohort of trainees. So with that, we're just kind of, um, some of them may just need a refresher. They've been away from school, so they're coming in more confident than dental phase two. Um, the literacy support then is offered. We, I try and make a link with the apprentice, maybe if they, if they are in need of literacy support, with getting them in touch with their um, their local um, education office um, or centre um, so that they can get help with that. Um, but it's normally the math support that, that is, is the issue. Um, when they come in then, when they're finished with their employer and they come into the training centre on phase two, I take them very early when they come in for a half day and we do study skills with them. Um, that's very beneficial. Um, a lot of them wouldn't know, wouldn't have identified their their learning style, um, they wouldn't have maybe looked at course notes. So um, just getting them into the habit of taking their own notes, reading their notes effectively. Uh, we do that very early on. Um, it really is very important to do it early on because we just build up um, a relationship with them. And just by, you know, um, letting them know that the support office is here, they will pop in and out, they'll text, they'll email. Um, not always to do with support in maths or literacy, but they might be having trouble, you know, with setting up their revenue account or filling out a particular form or something. So they can come in and we'll, we'll give them a hand with that. Um, so during that study skill session, we also do a trade specific maths test. So this would be, you know, there would be a specific one um, for carpentry or met fab or whatever. And again, if they score less than 70%, we just highlight that to them and you know, they can avail of the supports. We also do a comprehension test with them just to, you know, some of them would be slow coming forward saying that they need literacy support. It's just a short comprehension um, and we just see where we are with that. Um, so I suppose the results then from the tests are shared with the individual first and they're also shared with the class instructor um, and the, the trainees would know that and then we have support classes are offered to them. So um, support classes can be offered one-to-one -one or small group. Um, they can come to the support room here to myself. Um, I have an open door policy. Um, I'm eight to half four, Monday to Wednesday and Friday eight to one. They can drop in, they can make an appointment, they can text me, they can email, email me. Um, um, so there would be a mixture depending on the trainee. We then have a maths tutor two evenings per week, um, which is currently online due to COVID, but we do have quite a good uptake in that. Uh, we have an electrical maths and science tutor two evenings a week. He's doing online as well as some face-to-face. -face. And we did have technical drawing support, but unfortunately we can't do that at the moment with COVID, but we're hoping to get that back soon. Um, I suppose the overall aim of the apprentice support service is first of all to identify the needs of apprentices during phase one, um, to encourage an uptake, the uptake of the supports because some of them are quite slow in coming forward looking for help. 
um, just to work with individuals to aid progression and increase the retention on apprenticeship programmes and avoid referrals. So other than the apprentices, I suppose, you know, there is an open door policy here. Um, we would have a trickle of other FET learners coming through. Mostly it would be people that are in need of ESAL support. Um, so again, it's linking them in with um, centres near their, themselves or they might come in just with a little help with notes. Uh, we've had a few coming in, looking just looking for help, filling out forms, Susie grants, things like that, if they're moving on, um, setting up their revenue accounts. Um, you know, the, a lot of people have issue with that. Um, note taking, study tips and um, learning difficulties. Just maybe, you know, we have some resources here, particularly for apprenticeships where we've broken down their course notes into more manageable, um, easily read documents. Um, and I suppose just backing that up on Moodle is um, the main thing that, you know, they, they have a variety of, of ways to learn. Um, so I suppose going forward, um, you know, the hope is to develop a whole centre approach to integrate literacy and numeracy. I'm doing the UDL as myself at the moment as well. Um, so the learners really like the, the maths, um, the maths lessons created into a video so that they can view it themselves when they go home. Um, yeah, so that's what we're about here and hopefully we'll keep going. Thank you. Thanks a million, Brenda. Um, and uh, as I say, I, I'm sure Brenda has said it all, I suppose, to herself. There are, we have about 8,000 apprentices in the Cork ETB. Now, they're not all in Cork uh, for every single part of their training, but we have about 8,000 as a general rule. Um, so that's an awful lot of people and an awful lot of work. And Brenda is playing a blinder out there in the training centre. I know myself from several visits with her lately. Okay, guys, so now we've come to that part of today where we have two of our students. Um, so Stephen and Orla, would you like to put on your cameras there? And so we might have a little bit of a chat and see what life was like. So Stephen um, yep. is here and he did the horticulture course in CSN and Tremor Road um, a few years ago. And Orla was one of my students last year. She did the emergency services course. So she was training to be a paramedic or a lot of the students there were training to be paramedics or go to the fire brigade or whatever. So Stephen, would you like to take the floor um, and tell us a little bit about why you came to college and what were the cool bits for you? Because you weren't 17 when you started in college. No, no. That's, uh... Yeah, like I left school when I was 17 and I didn't know them with myself. And then I got to like 25. I thought, yeah, I better start doing things. And uh, then I, um, at 27, I found CSN and I rang Dan. I just asked him about the greenkeeping course. So I enjoy working outdoors. And uh, he told me to apply anyway. So I applied. I got into level five for horticulture and then went on to do greenkeeping. And uh, now I'm in CIT. But um, yeah, I'll just say it's a hell of a lot easier being, I think, a adult doing education. Because when you're a child, like you just want to be a part of the group. You don't like take it seriously. I didn't anyway. But when you're an adult, it's like, you know, you're not going out on Tuesday nights. Like you're, you're, you're watching football and going to bed at a reasonable hour. Like it's a... Uh, you're a lot more confident. You have a plan as well. Like, you know, when you're a kid, you don't think five years in the future. You know, mm -hmm. I plan, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah, I want to do this, I want to do that. Um, yeah, it's a hell of a lot easier being an adult, I think, doing it. Now, that's grand because, you know, I was 27 at the time. I know lads who are older in their 50s who are doing it, and uh, they did level five and level six. But because of COVID now at level seven, they couldn't handle the computer, so they dropped out. And uh, so, you know, there is two sides to the coin. Like, you have to be, I'm not trying to put people off, but like, you, have to, you know, there's a, like, there's a fine line. Like, like, I was grand because I can 
and work his own. Uh, the lad I'm talking about who was older just couldn't handle it, couldn't hack it. And it's unfortunate because he's so sound, like he's a great guy. And uh, so, you know, it's easier for some people and it's harder for others. Like, I'm probably rambling, but uh, yeah, like, yeah, like I'm just saying, even like when you're younger, you don't, yeah, you don't have that plan. You don't think, oh, what career am I going to have? Like, when I was 17, like, can you remember back, Stephen, to just before you went in? You said you rang Dan. Now Dan Daniel Crowley yeah. is the coordinator of the course. That's that's the the Dan you're talking about. But can you remember kind of where your head was at before you decided? Yeah, I'm going to take chance at this course. And and do you remember why? You know, now you're a couple of years down the road again, and yeah. your perspective would be different. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like when you're, yeah, you know, I was doing nothing in my life, like. It's that you're 20, you just want to party and you just want to like be with your friends and like just enjoy yourself. But I started running and stuff, I started running and playing football again when I was like 25. And I was like, you know, it seems my mates were doing things and I was kind of like, yeah, I kind of have to get a kick up the arse and start working. And I ended up doing a, at my local rugby pitch, I was just cutting the grass there and filling in potholes. And I love that. Like, I love being outdoors. So I found the green keeping course online and uh, I rang Dan and he, I was chatting with him like, and he was like, oh yeah, yeah. He, like, I have all the time in the world for Dan. Like, I have so much time for him. Uh, and uh, yeah, we just, uh, that like that. So I went into level five. I started cutting grass at my pigeon putt. Went into the green keeping level six and I got into a proper golf club. I won't say the name of it. Um, and I would have had a job there if it wasn't for COVID. Like that's the way it was going. And then COVID happened. No work, so I was like, ah, I'll see what CIT, give it a go. And uh, yeah, I'm doing CIT now. And it's grand. It's like, Do you yeah. find, Stephen, that some of the stuff that you did with Dan in the heart and the greenkeeping helped you with CIT stuff? Yeah, it's just like, you know, I don't care about growing vegetables, so... Doing horticulture in CIT is a lot more agricultural based kind of in that sense. Well, uh, you know, I, I want to be able to cut a, cut a line and perfectly straight, like, do you know what I mean? Like, that's, that's all I like doing. Like, I, like, I have no intention of ever opening a business or having, a, you know, a farm like this. So looking back with, you know, if I got my job in the place, I wouldn't have left. Like, I would have stayed there working. Um, but you know, CIT, CIT is only two years. Like, I can do two years, you know what I mean? It's not. You're enjoying it, though, yeah? Yeah, it's, well, no, I don't enjoy Zoom. Like, I like going in. I love, like, CSM, I love going in to the people. Like, yeah. to my class, where I just so sound. And I enjoy it, like that. So, if you thought, like, if I was going in and out to CS, CIT, it'd be grand. It's just that we're stuck on a computer screen that you're staring at for a few hours. And it's just impersonal like so you're just like whatever but um look like you know it got because i'm at the state like you know i'm doing level seven because i want to see if i can do it you know i never did like that i was saying i did nothing in school i never like i didn't study i didn't do homework i was just like yeah whatever and i still probably yeah i still don't have a study plan i still don't know how to study but i get the work done that's the that's the main thing and uh yeah it's just like you're old, you're older, so you have more confidence. And just like if you're thinking of doing it, just do it. Just do a year. Do you know what I mean? Like if you do a year, what's a year? You know, it goes a hell of a lot faster than you uh, than you can think. Do you know what I mean? Brilliant, Stephen. I'll probably come back to you in a minute, or there might be some questions from the audience yet, or someone else will see. Can we go over to Orla there now for a minute or two? And Orla, um, as if I didn't know what the story was, but please do tell us um, what it was like for you to come into college. Um, so in the first year of secondary school, I was diagnosed with a long-term illness. And because of that, I didn't have the same priorities as most of everyone else in my year in school. I wasn't aiming for a 625 in the leaving cert. My aim was just to sit it and do that successfully. Um, I did sit it successfully and I was really happy with it but 
because I'd missed a lot of school because I was ill and balancing treatment, I didn't really know what I wanted to do entirely. And the only thing that stood out to me was the paramedic science course in UL, but I didn't think I'd ever get the points for it. So my mom told me about the emergency services course in CSM. So I applied for that as I saw nothing to lose, managed to get a place on it. And my aim was to go from there and on to UL. Um, I loved the course at CSN Emergency Services. I got so much out of it, met such like so many friends and received support from the stepping ground over to where I wanted to go next as I don't think I was ready to fully progress into a college as I was getting used to it. It was a different way of teaching where we we're treated as adults and not spoken down to. Um, but sit cut because I did emergency services in CN, I realized I didn't want to go to UL. Um, numerous speakers came in and spoke about the different pathways I could take. And one thing that popped up was the London Ambulance Service and how if you go into that, you're going to walk into any job and you're going to receive diverse calls and you're going to see every trauma under the sun. So I was, I was just, that's what I wanted to do by then. Um, and I landed up using UCAS to apply to the UK. And I did a few interviews in various colleges and was offered a place in the University of Greenwich. So that's where I am now. I'm doing paramedic science over here in the UK. And I start my placement with the London Ambulance Service in January. So it took me longer to get there, but I'm going to be graduating the same time as if I had started in UL. And if I decide to come home, I'm going to be the equivalent of an advanced paramedic. And I had that opportunity to take a slow or a pace towards where I wanted to go and ensure it's what I wanted to do. And another thing, a blessing in disguise is that with further education, they kind of think of the bigger picture than just, just the course you're on. We were made through word processing, which I absolutely despised, but it was such a blessing. Careful, your teacher is in the audience. <laughs> yeah, but I despised it. I'm not going to deny it, but it was the biggest blessing in disguise because of COVID and now all learning is online. So if I hadn't done that, I'd be lost. So it teaches you different life skills than just your course, which is huge benefit to me anyway. Yeah, thanks. So I, I'd have to agree the number of times I stood in front of students and said, lads, word processing, you're going to need it. You're going to need yeah. it. And they say, no, Karen, we can do this, particularly the younger ones. No, we can do this. We can do this. And I know your teacher and others, they were demented trying to get people, come on, you must do this. Yeah. But I'm, I'm glad you're saying like it, it stood to people hugely in the end. It stood to people with all those assignments that people had to do last May and all of us had to correct them. Um, huge ones. I mean, I, I got assignments in that were like 60 and 70 pages long. It was just insane stuff. Um, but you're over in Greenwich now because I know you had several different offers. There was, there was yourself and another two in the class and he had loads of different offers from different places. So um, it's only recently I found out it was Greenwich that you landed in. Um, and I think you kind of said it earlier, but am I true? Am I is it true to say that some of the stuff you did at level five has helped you now in, in with well, besides word processing now, but has helped you in the kind of stuff they're delivering theory wise for where you are? Oh, entirely. Even <clears throat> even just the the different courses that we did with emergency services and the fact that we got to do emergency first responder. In my interviews and in my personal statement, I was able to talk about that. So that's the only reason I landed an interview in the first place is because I had experience that applied to the course I wanted to go on to. Mm. Um, and every Friday we have a, a skill session and I'm from the Mercy First Responder. We've already come in contact with a lot of the medications being used and the procedures personal protective equipment so uh, lots of it and anatomy and physiology that's one of the main components of this course. yeah that's a huge I component that. i was her anatomy teacher she has to say that yeah. <laughs> okay um lads is there anybody else who'd like to ask stephen or orla a question um there is a question there um carol in the in the chat channel for oh, uh, for Stephen, um, how important was it for you to do a course you were actually interested in? Um, Jesus. Uh, yeah, like if, you know, if I was doing computers, I wouldn't have bothered my arse down it. Like there's no point. Like, like 
like that. And that's that, you know, in 10 years time, I could do something completely different in my life. But um, right now, I knew I wanted to work outdoors. And uh, that's the only thing I really cared about. So find like doing the horticulture, like when I did level five horticulture, again, is very, you know, uh, vegetables and stuff like that. And like, I don't care about that. But it was a, like, you know, it was something I had to do to do the level six and do greenkeeping, which I was actually more interested in and I did better. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't bother doing it, something just for the sake of doing it. Not now, not my age. Um, there's no point. I just get a job and get money. There's no point in just wasting time learning, studying something that you don't care about because it, for me anyway, it, there's no point. Brilliant, Stephen, thanks. Do you have any more, Helena? Uh, no, but they're definitely feeling the love um, in the <laughs> audience for um, Orla and um, Stephen. And I have to say, I'm feeling it myself. I'm really inspired by you. Well done. It's fantastic to see it. Yeah, uh, I, I wasn't Stephen's teacher, but I've heard so much about Stephen and, and all sorts of things that he did, both from um, Dan and from our acting deputy principal um, as well, who would have worked with him a bit. Um, and I just, I'd, I'd be here until Christmas if I was to talk about Orla and all the things that she did and, and overcame while she was with us as well. So I wish the two of you really, really well. Um, and as I think somebody said in the chat there, you would be great encouragement to other school leavers and other students who were thinking of, of coming to any education level, really. Um, so thank you so much for being here and and... If we can help in any way in the future, just get on to us. Okay, guys, I'm going to move as quickly as I can now. We have two more people to talk. Adele is coming to us from the prison. Um, she is the coordinator of syst uh, educational systems there and outreach systems as well. And then after that, we have John, who is from our outdoor education center in Kinsale. So over to you, Adele. Hi everyone, um, my name is Adele Cunningham. I'm the head teacher in the education unit in Cork Prison and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of uh, what we do in the prison and our kind of related projects. I just need to share the screen. Um, give me one minute. Okay. So the first slide here just gives you a picture of um, the first prison when we started out and working there 20 years. Uh, we recently then moved to a new prison um, directly across the road. We moved there in 2016. Closed, medium security, catered for about 275 prisoners, everybody over 17 years of age. We do a, numerous, a number of different programs, QQI, starting at level three for the guys with basic um, reading and writing skills right up to level five. We do Leaving Cert, we also have Open University. We do quite a range of practical classes and just some, some photographs of the work, just to give you an idea of the standard. Uh, the first number of them are all ceramics. We go into match craft, we call the men's shed class. We have uh, woodwork classes, again, just shows you the level of skill. A lot of these guys would never have done woodwork before coming into the prison, but you can see how quickly they can become quite skilled. Um, Basically, her motto will be the same as it is for the ETB, a pathway for every learner. I included the slide, this particular one here, which would be a kind of a cot, a rocking cot, just to, to highlight the fact that a lot of the lads who would be in with us have children, have small kids themselves on the outside. And just to highlight, um, you know, emphasize the question, who is looking after the families, who's looking after the kids when the dads are locked up. Uh, art classes would be very popular. We also do a stained glass workshop, which is run in conjunction with the Arts Council. Uh, we have specific programs for travelers. I included this part here just to highlight the fact, the conference I was at a number of years ago, they spoke about travelers making up 1% of the general population. However, they make up between 30 and 35% of the prison population. I would say again, strong links, lack of education, social disadvantage. Pathway for Every Learner, we run courses in um, mediation skills families have had a feuding issues, teaching them the um, skills in negotiating. Uh, every summer, we run our own kind of um, art exhibition on Spike Island. There's a, a national 
um, exhibition run in Dublin every two years, but we kind of tend to do one things better. But one step better in Cork and we have ours every year, this year being the only exception because of COVID. Um, a lot of our lads are very interested in sports, health and fitness. They're probably as fit now as they ever were. Very little access to drugs, thankfully, while they're inside. Um, no access to alcohol unless they make their own. So we uh, offer a community coaching program. Um, this is run in collaboration with the Cork Sports Partnership, where we have sports coaching classes delivered by like, the different organizations listed here. They come into the prison once a week on a Thursday, deliver the sports coaching training on Thursday. And then the other four days of the week, the lads are in the main school uh, competing an overall award in uh, level three with a view to doing level four modules with us. And then later on going on, hopefully to the other further education colleges. Uh, in the last number of years, we've done a lot of work with UCC. We have delivered um, adult continuing education classes with a lecturer, James Conan, James Atuma, where somebody comes in uh, one afternoon a week uh, for eight or 10 weeks giving lectures in different areas relevant to the lives. We also offered a certificate in mental health. Our first two students graduated earlier this year and 100 students completed this program with UCC across Cork. The lads in the prison did every bit as well and better than others. For the first time this year, we had what we call an inside out program, where um, eight students from UCC who are studying in the Department of Sociology and Criminology, this is the first time it ever happened in the history of Cork Prison, they were allowed to come into the prison and sit in the classroom beside seven or eight of our own students to study the same module, criminal justice and social justice. Uh, it offered our lads the opportunity to realize that they're every bit as competent and capable as the students who are actually in, had come through mainstream. And I'm hoping that it offered people who were coming in from the outside, just a chance to see that these guys really are very little to, different to themselves. A lot of them will probably go and work in the field of criminal justice, criminology later on, and maybe their experience will impact the decisions that they make. We do a lot of work with CIT. They come in in the springtime to do a lecture series. The reason I particularly like this lecture series is that some of these lectures are actually delivered in our Dylan's Cross project, which I'll come to in a few minutes on the um, outside the prison, um, talks about lectures in film language, any, you know, 20 different topics. It can be entrepreneurship, it can be science for life, starting your own business, just planting the seed with the lads. Maybe they would be interested in going on to CIT, do the modules with us, level three, level four, onto the further education college. That pathway would take them to CIT if they wanted down the line. I have um, the, the agencies that are involved, the prison service, the ETB ourselves. Then we also have IASIA, which is the Irish Association for Social Inclusion Opportunities. We work quite closely with them on a number of different initiatives that we run. Here I've just a link to an article which is in the newspaper. Our chief executive, Dennis, mentioned this at the very first lecture. A guy who learned to read and write at the prison um, later found out he had dyslexia. And again, as, as mentioned earlier on, an awful lot of our students would have learning difficulties, which probably led to the reason that they left school and dropped out so early. But this guy overcame that and he recently graduated with an honours degree in construction management from CIT. So exactly kind of the pathway that we're trying to encourage more and more of our students to, to set out on. This is just a photograph I took of a graduation ceremony where the president of UCC, retired now, Patrick O'Shea, came in to give our students um, to award them their certificates. The reason I included that is because the photographs I think were quite important because the photographs were taken with the president shaking the hand of each of them, each one of the students individually. And a copy of that photograph was sent out to the family members. So I'm hoping that it plants the seeds with the kids of the lads who were in prison, that, oh, my father attended lectures with UCC or with CIT. Um, and, you know, perhaps they would look at that as an option down the line. A lot of lads would have said that UCC was as far away as Timbuktu for them as kids. It just never entered their heads to aspire to, to attend either CIT or UCC. Here I have a little bit of information, just background information. Uh, it was done in research in three of the prisons about two years ago. Four out of five prisoners, 80% left school before their leaving cert. More than half left before their junior cert. Over a quarter never attended secondary school. That over a quarter would be guys at 12 and 13 dropping out of school, a lot of them struggling with reading and writing. And a big, that would be against the backdrop of the wider population where 90% of students would complete their leaving search. Look at some more stats. Again, I would like a lot more reporting done. I would like a lot more research done in the area of prison education health. 
Well, anyway, the most deprived areas in the country had 145 prisoners per 10,000 people. The least deprived areas had six prisoners per 10,000 people. It highlights the link between social disadvantage and ending up in, in prison quite starkly. Looking at it from a cost and a financial perspective, just to give you an idea, if somebody commits a serious crime at the age of 16, 17, which unfortunately there's more and more of, it will cost 350,000 euro per year per person to go to Orbistown. Once they hit 18 and they enter the likes of Cork prison, the average cost is going to cost 75,000 euro. And I always say, like, think of what we could do with education with that amount of money if we had it to play with. For those of you who attended last Friday afternoon's lectures, you might remember Carl speaking about um, adverse childhood experiences and the link between having four or more of these experiences and ending up with four and a half times more likely to develop depression, the mental and health impacts, 14, 14 times more likely to have suicide. Now, these would be the norm for our guys. The reason I included one of the slides earlier on from the woodwork is a guy we have in prison at the moment who's a really very competent, very capable guy. You know, you'd meet him, you would think he's absolutely no different to any of our own kids. He would be a guy whose own father would have been in prison when he was growing up. Obviously, if his father was in prison, he's going to have parental separation. His mother, mental health issues, was an alcoholic. So here we have these two adverse childhood experiences. Oftentimes, they go hand in hand together left school when he was 12. His mother wasn't able to rear him. He was being reared by his grandmother who was doing her best. Unfortunately, his grandmother died when he was 14. So now automatically you're going to have the physical and the emotional neglect pieces um, brought into the equation before ever we go to the other side of, of, of this whole circle. And unfortunately, every second guy I will talk to in the prison will have this kind of a, of a start in life. So just the last couple of slides, I believe if we want to change these pathways, we need to work with the families of the guys who are in prison to prevent the next generation coming through. I think um, the education, the ETB in Cork can be quite proud. They have uh, supported the Dylan's Cross project for the last 25 years, which offers education and support to the female relatives of the lads who are in prison. Just one example out of hundreds, a girl who started that course with us 25 years ago, at the time did modules in childcare would have been in CBA. She then went on to the College of Com to do childcare modules down there, qualified as a childcare worker, is still working in the childcare industry today and is a manager in the childcare center where she's working. She describes how this program changed her life. It changed the whole dynamic in her relationship with her husband who at that time was actually in prison and her own daughter has gone on to third level education. And there are numerous different examples of um, people once they're put on the pathway and supported on the pathway, how they can overcome generations of this disadvantage and this um, connection with the prison. Uh, another feature of the Dylan's Cross project for the last number of years, um, uh, the ETB in collaboration with IASIO in collaboration with Cork Sports Partnership and the prison service, have offered a week long summer camp to children of the prison population. We also include kids from Cork Penny Dinners, from um, the other homeless organizations. And for most of them, it is the only opportunity they have for any structured activity for the summer. I would argue that really for a lot of these kids, we would be best placed having this run for the full month of July and August. Um, the kids are provided with backpacks, with sporting gear, either from Kellogg's Cool Camps or from um, the different uh, GAA, Basketball Ireland, the different organizations that are involved with it in this forest. It is hugely subscribed. I think we started with 30, 40 the first year, and we now have 70 kids, and we probably would have more if we had more places. Uh, we printed, got printed this year, um, kind of a report on the Dylan's Cross Project celebrating 25 years. Um, again, as I would say, I think great credit is due to the ETB, to the prison service for supporting the project. Uh, just finish basically saying, um, you know, a lot has changed, a lot still needs to be done. I'm very hopeful. I think social inclusion is becoming more and more of, um, kind of being highlighted more and more. And I think with our, you know, with the ETB and our chief executive in place, we have a new director general in the prison service with this conference. I think we can do a lot more to uh, benefit prisoners and their families uh, by kind of changing strategies and policies, trying to support the, um, these people and kind of break this history of intergenerational 
intergenerational offending and uh, the whole poverty cycle that leads to imprisonment. So that was a whistle stop tour. I didn't time myself, Carl, but I'm hoping I'm not too you're, far over the 15. You're absolutely fine. Thank you really very, very, very much. And, and as, as Nula said there in the chat, shocking statistics. But, you know, our, our intention here in having you on was to start raising awareness. You know, those of us that have been listening today, and we might be thinking during the week of what we've heard, and we might start talking about just how disadvantaged, disadvantaged these lads are and how disadvantaged their family members are mm -hmm. too, for all sorts of reasons. Um, it's all, you know, I, I consider myself in a, to be in a very cushy position when I think of some of the things that some of my students and some of your learners um, have had to put up with in their lives. Um, and, and I think it's, it's when we talk about these things that um, we'll help those things change, you know, and hopefully improve certain things. We'll, just, we'll start small and we'll, we'll work our way up. Anyway, does anybody want to ask any questions of me, Del? Nobody's I think shouting. There is, I think there's a question in there, um, Carl, in the chat channel. I'm just trying to look for it. Um, about um, I'm trying to see who asked it about mentors. Um, is there mentors? It's Cora. Sorry. Do you have any mentors from these um, backgrounds? No, um, there's a huge amount of work. I really do believe we're only at the tip of the iceberg and what needs to be done. I suppose what I'm trying to illustrate is how a little bit of, uh, of support can go such a long way with these people. Um, like we have a post-release project, but at the moment the post-release coordinator is so busy trying to organize housing because so many of them are, are homeless that um, her time is taken up fully with that. But I mean, it's been mentioned numerous times. I think a mentoring service would be a, a huge benefit. So when the lads go on to the further education colleges, if they could get the support, it would, it would allow them to stay there and to succeed. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Adele, so much. Um, and if you have any more questions for Adele or whatever, my email address there is in the chat up there. My first name, full stop, my second name at corkytv.ie um, and fire away any questions you have. Um, so, John, uh, we keep the best to last, do we? You're going to bring us outdoors into the fresh air. Well, maybe not now. I think, Trevor, we've been infected by your weather up there in Dublin. Um, it's it's turned not so lovely in the last few minutes. So, John, over to you and tell us. Um, John was on a, a panel yesterday with Cara, um, and he's here with us today. So you're a very busy man at the moment, um, and we'd love to hear what you have to tell us about what you do. Um, well, thanks very much for the the, the invite this afternoon, Carol and, and Farad, and, and well done. It's, it, it's a fantastic production, this series of uh, Four Fridays. Um, good afternoon to everybody. So. Um, I'm going to try and maybe just energize us for a moment. Can you get the chat box ready there, please? And what I'd like you to do in one quick word or sentence is, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear outdoor education? I don't mind, put in what comes to my cold. Well done, fun, sailing, hippie, nature, brilliant, exciting, kayaking, breeze, horticulture, cold, more cold, lots of cold today, brave, getting out fresh air. Okay, come on, somebody put in well-being, please. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well, listen, thanks very much for, um, for contributing to that. And so just to start off by saying how um, interesting I found the, the talks from Stephen and Orla this afternoon. I can actually relate to them a lot myself because my own pathway into outdoor education was quite different than the, the traditional mainstream route. I, I was really lucky. I only tripped across it by accident uh, through scouting and, and so on. Um, but I have a few slides here this afternoon that Farad's going to put up for us there now. Um, I had a few tech issues myself earlier on, and they're going to guide us through the next uh, 45 minutes, Carol, we have, isn't it? <laughs> no, folks, I, I won't keep you too long. I know you've all been working hard this week, um, so I, I'll keep it to a few brief uh, slides. So um, I suppose just to, to say that uh, Kinsale Outdoor Education Centre, um, obviously we're, we're based here in the, the beautiful uh, harbour town Kinsale. Um, 
We have been part of formerly the VEC and um, more recently the ETB since the early 1980s. Um, but the, the origins of outdoor education in Ireland go back much further than that. But really the first centre start, uh, started to sort of uh, be developed in the 1970s. Um, we're Department of Education funded and uh, there's also uh, 12 more centres around the country. But uniquely, Cork ETB is the only ETB that has two centres, um, because we also have another centre down in Skull as well, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, but we also have a, a great interest in inclusion. Um, it has only really sort of developed formally, I'd say, in the last 10 years, and it's still got a long way to develop. And I suppose when I was preparing for this afternoon, one of the points that I wanted to perhaps celebrate with you all is that we have benefited from COVID-19. We've all learned to uh, interact online so rapidly, more so in, in, in 10 months than we have in the last 10 years. And I certainly feel um, that Cork ETB uh, employees or teachers and frontline staff are much more aware of what uh, we're offering in our different centres and schools now. So I suppose this afternoon is perhaps a, a call out to all of you to see how Kinsale OEC can support you in the challenges that you, may, you might uh, face in, in sort of meeting the needs of your learners. And um, just also to acknowledge in that topic of inclusion around outdoors, the Cara Centre in Tralee, which is on the campus of IT Tralee, um, they have a specific remit to develop sport for those in the disability sector. And uh, that's the conference that Carol was referring to yesterday, where we had people from all over the world uh, tuned in for the day. So it really was a, a fantastic acknowledgement of how far ahead Ireland is in terms of the international community of adventure and outdoor education inclusion. And just to say as well that the team of instructors here, um, they're a very small but uh, dynamic and strong team. Um, they have been award winning in the last few years for their work, uh, particularly around sailing, power boating and canoeing and kayaking on the water. Um, so we can move on there now, Farah. Thank you very much. So um, here's an interesting photograph. Um, so I just want to focus on what is outdoor education, because sometimes people get confused. Or, well, what's an adventure centre? What's an outdoor education centre? Thank you, Mary, for putting that up. I appreciate that. And so the first core principle of outdoor ed is development of the self. And perhaps if you've been for a hill walk or you've been out surfing or whatever, you might be able to relate to that in that perhaps you might have grown more confident or feel a, a better sense of self-worth through these activities. And um, probably the most important one for me is teamwork. And again, that's part of the call to action this afternoon, folks. If you have new cohorts of students coming together, well, perhaps consider getting us involved. We can run a day for you where we can break down those sort of nervous barriers that a new cohort may have coming together. Um, and the, the third and final kind of key pillar of OE is an awareness and a care for the natural environment. And now more so than ever, we're part of educating the next generations to look after the planet for us and those that come after. Just to, to say to you, this photograph here is a really good example of some of our adaptive or inclusive work. That's um, our young Mariner students back last September. And um, that's a, a young lad that's a very successful student with his Rory in the wheelchair there. And I've asked his parents, could we use this photograph? And he's, he was more than delighted to allow it to be used. But it just shows a group of young people coming together. There's a very obvious challenge. How is Rory going to get across the stream to his campsite? And they all thought laterally, they improvised using the kayaks turned upside down, a clear demonstration of teamwork. And um, so I just thought it was a really nice moment in, in our Young Mariner program. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about our Go Adventure program in a few moments, um, because it is one that's probably very relevant to your interests here this afternoon. And um, I suppose the ultimate goal for us is that disability and inclusion wouldn't be treated as a separate uh, topic of work. It would be completely normal. It would just be part of our everyday activities that whether it's Johnny in the wheelchair or Mary with autism could feel completely comfortable in a standard um, outdoor education session. 
Okay, thank you, Farad. We'll go again there. So um, I, I just want to share with you one of our, our recent big successes. Um, last summer, the water sports inclusion games were held in Kinsale. Can you imagine 500 people from all over Ireland coming to Kinsale right in the middle of a busy August weekend? Um, and it was amazing. The town shut down for it. The natural energy of volunteering that came from people from all sectors and backgrounds was just wonderful. And I remember when we were planning back in January for it, I'd heard about these wheelie boats that were being produced in the UK. And there was talks about renting one uh, for the weekend in Kinsale. And I came away from that quite dejected going, that, that's no good at all because you're going to leave people empty handed afterwards. There'll be no legacy. And to, you know, to the great credit of uh, John Fitzgibbons and the, and the team in procurement, we actually managed to procure a wheelie boat last year. So it's based here with us now in the OEC. And um, in particular, this summer, we were able to make that boat available to many different uh, families of people, uh, you know, using a wheelchair to get outside for the first time after a lockdown and to enjoy the wind and the, the breeze in their hair and have a good old uh, tour around Kinsale Harbour. And, and now we're working on getting wheelchair users to train up and become the skipper of the boat. So that to me would be when the wheelie boat is fully inclusive. Uh, so just an example of some of the work we do there. We'll go again now, Farad. So this is another piece of work that we've been very involved in over the last few years. And um, this uh, is obviously all around our canoe and kayak inclusion work. So uh, if you look on the photograph there on the left hand side, um, we collaborated with the Cara Centre and we have uh, purchased a um, batch of equipment that came from the States that allows standard canoeing and kayaking equipment to be modified and adapted to allow those with disability to enjoy the sport safely um, and, and experience adventure. Um, you can see in the top photograph there, that's one of our students there. Uh, we had to bribe him with jammy dodgers uh, to, to get him to wear his mask. So the treat was at the end of the session, he'd get his jammy dodgers. But um, again, another very good example of collaboration. So we've been working with the sports partnership and their sports inclusion development officer, uh, Phoenix Kayak Club there in the Lee Field. Some of you might know it if you're out walking in that area and um, allow us to work from there. So that's one of the things that I wanted to highlight to you today, folks. Don't think that you just have to come to Kinsale. We can come out into your centres and your communities, your local parklands or waterways and support you with whatever project work you might be doing um, on your, your own programmes. OK, Farad, uh, we're making great progress through the slides. Now, this is the one that I was keen to sort of uh, talk to you about this afternoon, folks. So. And um, this is effectively a feeder course for adults moving into further education and training. And, and what we noticed over the last few years is that there was some people that were perhaps a little bit nervous about going back into a full time academic year course. So we, we, we pitched this program to, to the ETB and basically it's a, a 16 week program part time Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays where we have a wide cross section of learners and they may have fallen through the cracks of mainstream second level education. Perhaps they may have come through Metal Mara or Youth Reach and they could be mature students. They could be career pivoting. Some people have maybe come through addiction and recovery. Uh, there could be low self-esteem, a whole variety of different uh, pathways. But really what we're doing is using those core pillars of outdoor education to help them redefine the self, to gain self-confidence, to become more resilient, more resourceful, make informed decisions, to learn to work together in a group and all through using the medium of the outdoors. So we've run through two successful cohorts now and we'll be starting again this February. And so that course from February to May would then allow people to move on to um, a further education intake next autumn. And the students that we've put through so far, over half of them have moved on to the likes of Colosse de Stéphane Kinsale College. So we've had a, a high success rate of progression. And also, I would say another 30% of them have got involved in employment outdoors or going back into their community. One very specific example that kind of rings true for me was 
one lady went back to West Cork to Skibbereen and she set up an outdoor orienteering program for folks in a, an elderly care home. I mean, what a really fantastic piece of, of work. And naturally, we had a few people that didn't work out in the course too. They're just not quite ready for that formality of, uh, of showing up uh, regularly to education, but we're hopeful they will come back to us in time. Um, so if you have any students on your radar, potential students on your radar that you think might just need a little bit of rebuilding before they come to uh, a further education course, please do uh, reach out to me. Um, Carol will share our contact details if needs be, and we can help you sort of get that confidence going uh, to move on next autumn. Now, Farad, where are we going? We're on to our last slide. Um, so just to reiterate a few things that we are really open to collaborations. Um, we, we, we work with a wide range of stakeholders. Um, our remit here is to serve not only the students of Cork ETB, but the other centers and colleges out there. So whether that's the team building side of things coming together, maybe looking at well-being. Or if there's specific learning outcomes that you might need to achieve, you know, it could be personal effectiveness, communication skills, we can assist with that as well. So over the last six weeks during the level five lockdown, um, we've been working very closely with the network of youth reach centres, just providing an opportunity to come together again, enjoy some safe outdoor activity and have something to look forward to each week as well. Um, we are also continually developing resources and equipment here as well. And um, so that's probably one of the strengths of the staff team here that um, there's no such thing as we can't do it. We'll figure out how can we make it work. And, and just to say um, one project that we're quite excited about is we're looking at developing a traineeship now that works with in collaboration with the CARA Centre and a few other stakeholders in that space to focus on outdoor instructors and equip them with much more detailed knowledge of an inclusion, diversity, adapting equipment, maybe even adventure therapy. And so that when they finish that course, they'll go back out into their communities around Ireland and hopefully develop pockets of activity. Um, so that's, that's almost me for this afternoon. I just wanted to thank um, Carol and, and, and the team for putting together this network of uh, events. And uh, please do reach out to us here in Kinsale OEC if we can support you in any of your work uh, with your students. And uh, the final thing is, I don't think it's uh, uh, too late at this stage to say happy Christmas to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so that's me. Thanks, Carol. Thanks a million, John. That was brilliant. Uh, last year, Orla would, would vouch for this. We sent the crew, the emergency services crew, to a lady called Etna Hunt. She's an occupational therapist. But she lectures, uh, she's a program for resilience for the students in UCC. So we got, gave them a little taster of that. But perhaps this year or next year, John Halpin has taken over from me there in CSN. Maybe, maybe they'll head down to Kinsale and do some water sports and that'd be brilliant team building Please. stuff. It would be fabulous. I'm Thank sure you. there's several people here who have something to say or ask. Um, shout now. Kalina, did you spot anything? I didn't, but I think I'll be going down to that skib with you, um, Carol, and, and going oh, there, no. trying, okay. to shift, trying to shift the COVID stone. I've been <laughs> sitting in front of this computer for, since last March. Honest to God, I'm, I'm gone geriatric. Um, <laughs> and I really am. I'd love it. And orienteer. I used to love orienteering when I was younger. Um, so bring it on. Yeah. Um, I see Derville is playing a blinder here in the chat all day. She's from St. John's Centre College and she's throwing up all sorts of stuff. I, I hope you're watching. I'll, I'll be sending out the chat anyway to people, so don't worry. Um, but so some people have asked about links. Is there anyone else who'd like to say anything? Because Farad can give you a microphone if you'd like to speak. Well, they're all very shy, Farad. They're all <laughs> maybe this uh, Friday afternoon. Well, yeah. uh, thank you so, so much. Thank you to everybody for coming. Um, pre please bring your friends next week. We're going to be talking. We have Deirdre Madden talking to us about free software, um, assistive technology software, but specifically for students. It's not for teachers this time. We have several people from different areas, James Bilson being one, um, talking to us about transitions in and out of FESH um, centres. 
We have uh, Ger Brennan, who was appointed the same time as Farad and myself, going to talk to us about virtual reality and what we're doing with that and special needs students in the future. And then I'll be telling you a little bit about assessments. Um, but we're just happy that you're here. We're delighted with the people attending. I hope you've got a good few take homes for today. And thank you so sincerely to all our panelists for being here because we could not do that, do it without you. Now to mind my right and left hand here in front of me, Farad and Helena, thank you too. Uh, take care, good luck and um, enjoy your evening. And hopefully we'll see you again, same time, same place next week for our last day before Christmas. Cheers folks, bye bye. Thanks everyone, have a lovely weekend and happy Christmas all, okay? <laughs>